Okay, so in the next session, we're gonna hear about rare neuroendocrine tumors and genetics. And I actually wanna qualify that as rare, but not quite so rare as we used to think, because the more you recognize something, the more frequent it becomes. Um, so we're gonna hear from um, Dean Ru uh, Ruther, I'm sorry if I apologize that, if I pronounced that wrong earlier. Ruther, I thought it was Ruther, sorry. Dean's gonna talk about medullary thyroid cancer, and then we're gonna hear about pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas, and then we're gonna have a geneticist talk about the genetics of endocrine tumors. So this is really an interesting and very up-to-date session, and um, I know that we have patients in the room who have both uh, medullary thyroid cancer and paragangliomas, so Great time for this. Dean, please. Thank you very much. Just before I, I uh, launch into my uh, talk about medullary thyroid cancer, I have to take the opportunity to follow up on a question that was raised earlier about the, the discrepancies in access and how, how do we ensure that people have access to these, these appropriate treatments across the country. And we do deal with a challenge in Canada in that the, the, the Canadian Health Act is a federal piece of legislation, but when it comes to funding health care, that is in the provincial jurisdiction. So we as experts can agree and Health Canada can approve a treatment, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's brought into clinic um, in Edmonton at the same time that it is in Halifax because it is up to provincial jurisdictions to decide how and when they are going to fund things. And that's why you see discrepancies across the country uh, in terms of what patients have access to. And, uh, and that is a problem all across cancer care. Um, I think it's a problem that affects patients with rare cancers more commonly um, we, we don't, uh, the, the, the breast cancer population doesn't let that happen because they have a very loud voice and a large group of patients who are impacted by those kinds of decisions. Same for prostate cancer, but if you are a patient dealing with a rare form of disease, cancers included, um, you don't necessarily have the same sort of access. And so it is extremely important that the, the medical community has an opportunity to work with organizations like CNETs. We need the patient voice to be helping us address those issues around in, um, inequities in access. There should be no difference across the country. If you are a Canadian citizen who needs care in our system, your, um, what you have access to should be similar. It may not be as convenient to access it from a small town in Prince Edward Island as it is in Edmonton, but your access, what you can access for care should be the same. So I will get off my soapbox. So um, I'm gonna to talk to you just a little bit about medullary thyroid cancer. Uh, and um, no question, neuroendocrine tumors are more common than we probably appreciated years ago. Medullary thyroid cancer is still a rare cancer, and so pa patients dealing with this disease uh, face almost a double hit. So they're dealing with a rare form of thyroid cancer, a rare neuroendocrine tumor, um, and many of the frustrations that all of you have experienced in regards to delays in diagnosis are also issue for these patients. Um, I won't spend a lot of time on this because you've heard this has been reviewed for you in other parts of the talk, but these neuroendocrine cells that are scattered throughout the body and make up what we call the diffuse neuroendocrine system. They share a common embryologic origin. They are cellular messengers and they communicate by releasing proteins. And we call this web of cells, this network, the, the diffuse neuroendocrine system. And they are scattered throughout the body. And as you can see, some of them reside in the thyroid gland. And in the thyroid gland, we call those neuroendocrine cells parafollicular C cells. So most of the thyroid is made up, whoops, pardon me, of these um, follicles of cells that produce thyroid hormone. But adjacent to those are these smaller cells, less frequent called C cells, which produce a hormone called calcitonin that is important in calcium metabolism. And so a medullary thyroid cancer is a form of neuroendocrine cancer that 
we believe derives from these parafollicular C cells. Medullary thyroid cancer cells, like their normal parent, produce calcitonin. And elevated levels of calcitonin in the blood are responsible for some of the symptoms that patients with medullary thyroid cancer complain of. Flushing, diarrhea, itching. Um, there are somewhere around nine to 10,000 new cases of medullary thyroid cancer worldwide. So that's a pretty small number every year. But the number of patients living with this disease is much larger than that because they can live with this disease, even disease that is advanced for many years. Medullary thyroid cancer is different than more common, what we call differentiated thyroid cancer in some very important ways. Um, um, probably one of the most relevant issues for patients affected by this disease is the potential for this problem to be something that is inherited. So we talk about medullary thyroid cancer sporadic cases, so cases which appear to develop in patients who don't have a predisposing family history, and that's probably about 75% of the cases that we see. And about 25% of patients with medullary thyroid cancer develop that disease because they have an inherited syndrome uh, that predisposes them to that. It's not always easy to tell in dealing with an individual patient whether they are dealing with an inherited, pro inherited problem, a new mutation, uh, or uh, one of these sporadic cases. And so um, understanding that family history and looking for other clues in the family history that might suggest the presence of a familial syndrome is very important. If you look at a large group of patients with medullary thyroid cancer, all stages of disease, 75% of those patients will live for longer than 10 years with their disease. If you are unfortunate enough to have advanced, locally advanced disease, so disease that is spread to lymph nodes in the neck, or disease that is spread to other parts of the body, liver, lung, bone, those are the common sites of spread, then those, only about 40% of those patients would be alive 10 years after a diagnosis. And from a medical oncologist's perspective, the treatment of this disease has been very frustrating. We, we really did not have a lot to bring to bear in the care of these patients other than to try to help manage symptoms up until the last couple of years. Um, this slide is just meant to show you again that patients with earlier stage disease can do very well for long periods of time and even patients with advanced disease, stage 4 disease that is spread to other parts of the body, live with the consequences of this disease for years. And so like other neuroendocrine tumors, managing patients with this type of cancer has challenged us within the cancer system because we tend to approach care from an acute disease perspective. Um, things need to be dealt with in a hurry. There's a period of time when you are looked after in the cancer system if you have breast cancer or lymphoma or lung cancer and if we've done our job well then we turn your follow-up back over to your family doctor. Or if you have a metastatic cancer and for many of the diseases we see, people don't live for many years with those conditions. Managing patients with neuroendocrine tumors, medullary thyroid cancer included, really challenges our system in the sense that we need to develop better models modeled on how we look after patients with chronic diseases like diabetes, hypertension, um, those kinds of issues. So, um, uh, like we talk about measuring the urinary 5-HIAA for patients with carcinoid syndrome, we can measure calcitonin in the blood, um, uh, and this can be helpful in making the diagnosis of thyroid cancer. Um, it's also part of the strategy in follow-up, and we can use it somewhat as a tool to assess how disease is behaving and whether it's responding to treatment. Um, another what we call tumor marker, carcinoembryonic antig antigen, not a specific test for cancer and not a specific test for medullary thyroid cancer. There are other types of cancer that cause an elevation in the CEA, but something else that we can follow over time. And it's, I would, I would say that these are never tests that would be the sole driver in decision making around treatment, but they are helpful to follow over time in terms of looking at trends. The most important part of care for a patient with medullary thyroid cancer uh, 
is surgical, so curative intent treatment, removal of the thyroid gland, removal of the lymph nodes in the neck that are affected, um, and even in advanced disease, like we do with other types of neuroendocrine tumors, resecting sites of metastatic disease in lung or bone is often a very effective way of palliating the problems that go along with this diagnosis. Radioactive iodine, which is traditionally used in managing more common types of thyroid cancer, has no role to play in the management of medullary thyroid cancer. So in the advanced disease setting, when we're seeing a patient who is dealing with new problems related to their medullary thyroid cancer, we have to always go back to that same discussion we were having earlier. Is there a role for a surgical intervention here? It may not cure the patient's problem, but it can be very effective in helping to palliate disease and helping people to maintain quality of life. External beam radiation treatment, um, this is not as, as sensitive a uh, disease to radiation treatment as um, more common types of thyroid cancer, but external beam radiation therapy can help to manage disease in lungs, perhaps that's causing airway obstruction or a lesion in the bone that is causing pain. Um, systemic treatment for this disease really has been largely around symptom control for a long time. Chemotherapy treatments, the drugs we use to treat other types of cancer, really have not um, had much role to play because they just haven't been terribly effective. Um, so we are often using agents like Imodium and narcotics like codeine and morphine to help patients manage diarrhea. Um, there is not a lot of good evidence from, from well-designed clinical trials to say that the somatostatin analogs can be helpful here, but anecdotally, I've certainly used these agents in helping patients to manage diarrhea, and I think they can, uh, they don't solve the problem, but they can be effective as an adjunct to some of the other uh, strategies we use. And then you've heard about uh, PRRT and MIBG treatments, so the delivery of, uh, of um, targeted radiation through an intravenous injection sometimes has a role to play in patients with advanced medullary thyroid cancer. There are some new drugs on the market uh, uh, that um, uh, we can access present, presently through uh, what we call compassionate access programs, and they are working their way through the regulatory processes in Canada so that we hope over the next year or two they will be available to us in the clinic. Um, Vandetinib and cabozatinib are examples of drugs we call tyrosine kinase inhibitors. So you've heard earlier today about a drug called Sutent another tyrosine kinase inhibitor. And there are about 400 of these molecules at various phases in, in either use in cancer care or in development. Um, and these two agents have both been shown in well-designed trials to impact the rate at which this disease can progress. They are not curative treatments, but they can help to slow progression of the disease. Like other neuroendocrine tumors, it is hard to overstate the importance of multidisciplinary care in the care of these patients. Um, um, in Calgary, where I work, we have a multidisciplinary group that uh, 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 looks after most of our neuroendocrine patients. We have a multidisciplinary thyroid clinic, and there is overlap between the clinicians that are involved in both of those programs. Um, there's no question that uh, multidisciplinary care helps to improve coordination and communicate coordination for patients in terms of uh, access to clinicians and investigations. Uh, it helps us with communication both within the team and um, with our patients. Um, it allows us to have those ongoing discussions about is it time to look at a repeat surgical treatment? Is there a role here for a local ablative therapy? And when is the right time? You've heard others talk about that today. Just because we have a tool or a hammer doesn't mean everything is a nail. And sometimes it's a matter of, yes, we have these, age, these things available to us, but maybe now isn't quite the right time to be bringing those on board. Uh, and I think one of the most important things we can do for patients through multidisciplinary care is educate them and help them to understand what it is that they are dealing with. The other thing that is increasingly important is the recognition of the need for 
access to rehabilitation services. And in seeing patients with thyroid cancer who have often had more than one surgery on their neck, sometimes three, four operations, and then we followed that up with external beam radiation treatment, we can have a cre an incredible impact on people's swallowing, breathing, and um, access to speech pathologists and um, uh, re pe people with specialty training and rehabilitation to deal with the issues that we cause for patients in treatment is very important. Um, and I mentioned earlier the importance of being aware of the potential for family history and genetics to be an issue here. And so appropriate access through our multidisciplinary clinics to medical geneticists who can help uh, patients to understand the consequences of genetic testing, what it means to do the genetic testing both for you and for family members, and to do that testing appropriately. Um, we, we often forget how much we rely on um, family support and caregivers. There are literally billions of dollars that the healthcare system saves because of the care that is provided to patients by family and loved ones. And I think part of our job is also to support those individuals around the patient because it's a tough journey for them. And, and uh, uh, I'm sure any of you who are, are caregivers in the room can relate to the experience of, of being in the room and the focus is on the patient, which is where it should be. But this is a struggle for our care providers as well. And I know the consequences of providing that day-to-day -day care, burnout, impact on your own health. Those are things that we're, I think, only just now starting to understand the consequences of. And with that, I will stop. Thank you. I'd like to invite Shereen Izzat to come up and tell us about pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas. Okay, so here comes the adrenaline parts. You're all awake. Show of hands, how many here have been diagnosed with a paraganglioma? Show of hands, how many of you have heard the diagnosis of paraganglioma mentioned by your medical oncologist? Almost zero, okay, 0.5. I think we're probably sitting next to the medical oncologist. <laughs> So here's the problem, and I think some of you here earlier, and in fact, many of you probably have heard, and, and uh, Dan remembers this, because years ago, there used to be a whole lot of people getting treated with MIBG therapy for neuroendocrine tumors. Guess what? Most of these patients probably were perigangliomas, and you'll see why in a minute, why I'm telling you this. Dan is looking at me now saying, oh boy, he's really crazy now. <laughs> so you've already heard, the reason why we call nets, what we call them, is because of where they're derived. So this is the beginning. This is how the embryo is actually developed. Think of it as if you're making a phyllo pastry, basically like this, <laughs> something like that. OK. Um, but essentially, um, what we're talking about here are modified neurons. So this is part of the neuroectoderm, which is the layer from which the fetus actually dedicates what is going to be the nervous system. And these are neurons that are dedicated and will always have the memory to produce a specific enzyme called tyrosine hydroxylase. This is the enzyme that is going to allow you to be able to make adrenaline and noradrenaline for the rest of your life in that particular cell. And when that cell turns into a tumor, what you have is a paraganglioma. When it occurs in your adrenal gland, we call that a pheochromocytoma. Most doctors don't know the difference between the two, but you will, at the end of my talk, hopefully understand why it's important for you and potentially for other family members, because just like what you heard about with MTC, where about a quarter will have a heritable condition, whereby in the case of MTC, you can actually find the child in the first year of life and take out the thyroid to prevent the thyroid cancer from developing. This is a situation where by diagnosing the patient, you're also diagnosing other family members because it's autosomal dominant. And Raymond Kim, who works with me in medical genetics, is gonna talk a little bit more about this a bit later. But really, what I want to establish here is just, just like the paraphyletic cells are, 
the cells in the ganglion or nerve bundles or the part of your electrical system that's able to work on your body to produce the hormones, to give them the electrical machinery that's required to promote that signal, is really part of that dispersed neuroendocrine system. So it's part of everything that we have in our bodies from the base of our brain all the way down to the very bottom, like I mean the real bottom, all the way. And it's very important to understand this because when you image people like this, you can have a tumor pretty much anywhere, and typically radiologists will call it a lymph node. And it's almost impossible for any radiologist who really is very honest to tell you the difference between a lymph node and a perigenlioma. They're identical in appearance. So that's why it's important to make that distinction. And they present with a variety of different symptomatology, very different from what would be associated with serotonin excess or chromogranin excess. We've already talked about, some of you already talked about, what other things can you measure? Well, if you know what the heritage of that tumor is, then you'll be able to intelligently know what to measure because you'll know exactly what it can produce. So the specific symptoms are very important because they include sweating, headaches, impending doom, palpitations, just feeling unwell, pretty much like what most of us feel at one point or another. So they're very common. However, what's unusual about them is that they happen without provocation. Much like the flushing that you heard about earlier, where with flushing, typically menopausal flushing usually has diurnal variation associated with excessive sweating and so forth. This is, again, this is a situation where unprovoked, without any type of stimulus, the person feels like it's the end of a world. And sometimes they're misdiagnosed as having anxiety disorders. They can also present just simply with a lump with a mass. It can obstruct pretty much anything from the top of your brain all the way down, as I said, to the very, very bottom. And of course, they can be identified just simply incidentally because you happen to have a diagnosis of a neuroendocrine tumor or breast cancer, anything else for that matter. And then somebody does an imaging study and they say, oh, you've got lymphadenopathy. You've got lymph nodes. When in fact, what you have are perigangliomas. How can we tell? Well, this is the location anatomically, and these are actually the, on the left, you'll see the perigangliomas when they're taken out. And um, you can see the gross microscopy compared to where they are located anatomically. And it can be all the way down. I've had patients, for instance, who have fainted repeatedly every time they try and pee. Why? Because they have a perigangliomas sitting just at the neck of their urinary bladder. Big problem. So this is the enzyme I was telling you about, uh, specifically tyrosine hydroxylase, and this is the rate-limiting enzyme. The reason why not only does this allow for the manufacturing of dopamine, and from dopamine you make norepinephrine and ultimately epinephrine, but this is the enzyme that is very robust and can be detected by immunostochemistry. So when you go back 20 years ago and say, oh my God, I think they may have made a mistake because one out of four times we're gonna be wrong, you can go back and you can detect this enzyme in your tumor, in your net, in your so-called carcinoid, and find out that really what it was all along was a perigangioma. And that will be able to tell you that this is clearly a neuronal tumor, one that has a capacity to make adrenaline or noradrenaline or both. And ultimately, this can drive a whole series of very different investigations. In addition, you can imagine anybody would know that a rise in noradrenaline can also give you high blood pressure, another very common manifestation. So intermittent episodes of headache as well as um, elevated blood pressure. The one thing that's somewhat unique, though, about these patients is they go from being very red to being very pale. They develop what we call pallor. So they're not only just red, but they go from the extremes. And the reason for that is because the substances are released, they open up the blood vessels, and the body reacts to that to counter that effect. So again, um, the other thing to remember is that uh, generally, the younger the patient, the more likely they are to have a heritable disease, meaning the genetics it didn't take long for the disease to brew, so to speak. And of course, if it's present on both sides of a body, very, very important to identify that because that makes the distinction between, oh my God, you've got cancer all over the place from having a cancer that happens to be multifocal. What do I mean by multifocal? Just like Grapes on a vine, you have multiple different primaries. Why? Because you're genetically predisposed. Every single part of your body is genetically vulnerable to develop its own tumor. 
So making that distinction is crucial. In fact, we sometimes, I will not let my surgeons operate until I have the genetic information. Sometimes I bug my uh, partner here, Raymond Kim. Where is he? Uh, he's always wondering, why is Shireen so insistent on getting the results so quickly? Because I need to know whether that patient is going to require very aggressive surgery for debulking of what is going to be invasive disease versus having to pick multiple different primaries from different parts of the body. Very important in terms of making uh, not only a surgical decision, but in co-managing these patients. Uh, there's a whole host of genes, and again, Raymond, we'll talk to you a little bit more about these, so I'm not going to dwell on them, but uh, uh, Sylvia and Osgar Mete, who works uh, with Sylvia also, are very good in that they're, because they're specialized, they can actually look at these specimens and they can say, you know what, we can actually look for the product of that gene, and if it is abnormal and it is lost, that's when she calls us up and say, you guys screwed up, you did not know that this is a familial case, you should be doing your homework and do the genetics on this case. Hopefully, then we can answer back and say, haha, we beat you to it, we already know. Um, so the pathology really is very important, and most importantly, uh, again, Osgar and Sylvia will tell you this, is that they actually look into the chart, and they see what biochemistry we've done, and they look at whether it's the elevation in the noradrenaline, the adrenaline, the dopamine, or combinations thereof. That actually will give us some idea, not only of what type of tumor, but even what part of the body where it might show up, because there are different biochemical profiles to these tumors in the neck, versus the chest, versus the abdomen, versus the pelvis, and so on. Uh, and again, immunohistochemistry can be very important. Knowing the anatomical distribution, I did not know, and I will confess up until recently, that there are neuronal cells and there are ganglia in the liver. So having these lesions appear in your liver does not necessarily mean you have metastatic disease. You can actually have multiple, which makes a huge difference in terms of prognosis and, and therapy, obviously. So the criteria of malignancy going back to the 2004, and this is about to change, is really undergoing a lot of very um, uh, radical changes because of our understanding of genetics. So even defining by the World Health Organization standards what malignancy really means is changing because of this new information of knowing the genetics, the anatomy, the histology, and marrying all of this with the imaging studies. Um, Osgar again and, and uh, Sylvia put together an actual protocol, and uh, this paper was published several years ago. Unfortunately, it has not been adopted in Canada very well, because uh, except in one institution where you can see here, this is what's called a synoptic report, which basically means it's like a menu. And it has a drop down so that the pathologist is required to fill each and every one of these fields to be able to comp comprise all this information. And at the end of the day, you come up with very critical information that's going to be able to give you an accurate diagnosis. You know whether this is sporadic or familial. What is the likelihood of this coming back? Where is it going to come back? And what kind of surgery you might anticipate and obviously instituting different therapies. We had a prismatic case, actually, and I will tell you that we've learned from our mistakes. Uh, this is a patient who was actually treated for a so-called kidney cancer. It was a renal cell carcinoma, and Sutnip was part of a trial. This was a trial patient, was entered as if it was a renal cell carcinoma. The patient responded beautifully, except for one problem. When they took out the tumor, the kidney tumor was not a kidney tumor. It was a periganglioma, and that was one actually one of the earliest studies. Uh, where at the time Jennifer Knox and I were uh, scratching our heads and, and basically we started a clinical trial to understand why Sutent was working on these tumors. And we've now identified in a subset of patients with periganglomas, there's a genetic signature of those who have SDHB loss, specifically one of the enzymes uh, that I was telling you about that causes a predisposition. Those patients respond exquisitely to sunitinib, and they get a rapid reduction of catecholamine, so there's an enzymatic effect, in addition to tumor shrinkage, and you can get really huge um, uh, responses uh, in these patients. Um, and this is just simply the pathway, so I'm not going to bore you with that, but these are many of the cases. Just to show you on the bottom here, this is one example of a patient who had multiple metastases to the point where she was written off and she was told that she has to be on oxygen all the time. Um, after six weeks of therapy, actually, her lungs cleared up. But the important thing is that when we tried to get her off, so she was going on the four weeks on, two weeks off, in the two weeks, the cancer would actually light up again to the point where she had to go back on the oxygen. We learned that we'd use continuous therapy in those patients. So we use smaller doses than compared to kidney cancer continuously, and this is now a multicenter study. 
Um, MIBG, I, I know that some of you have heard about it, and, and we used to think that MIBG was the be-all, end-all. I will tell you right now, and I don't know whether David Laidley is still here in the audience, but MIBG is a diagnostic test that costs a lot of money, it's very specialized, it's very good for intraadrenal periganglioma's or pheochromocytomas, but truth is, octree scanning is even better. It lights up perigangliomas, and hence even more of the uh, conflicting information, which sometimes can be confusing. But the good news is that, as far as I'm concerned, we're able to, I will be on time, uh, target this for the purposes of not just diagnosis, but then identifying at the end of the day, bringing this all together to be able to say that the perigangliomas are part of the net family, and they are eligible and should be treated with PRT when all other surgical and medical therapies have failed, and this is a situation where we are currently employing it, and I've had some resistance from some of my colleagues, just like they feel that MTCs are not necessarily the neuroendocrine tumors because they're not the carcinoids, which they could argue, um, but I think it's important to remember that this is a, um, a form of disease that can be managed. One last point that I want to just emphasize, as many of you have heard already, uh, PRT is great and gallium-68 is wonderful, but they're the iPhone 6s, and this is no longer really acceptable, to be honest with you. The future is already here, and already in Europe, they're working on molecules that actually represent somatostatin receptor antagonists. The beauty of an antagonist is it can identify even a receptor that's not perfect, a so-called misfolded receptor, which will allow us to be able to identify tumors twice as we have so far. We can target many therapies, including drugs that we typically use by mouth, so that this is a world that I think is about to explode, is going to change dramatically, and even though we have seen some improvements and, and there is uh, light at the end of a tunnel, my prediction is that we are still very much behind the eight ball, and even though an iPhone 6 is great, it still is behind the time. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Shereen. Now I'd like to call on Raymond Kim, who's already gotten his introduction, um, because you all know what he's going to talk about. Raymond is a geneticist at Princess Margaret Hospital in Mount Sinai, and he's going to tell us about the genetics of nets. Hi, so th thanks for uh, inviting me today. <clears throat> so I'm a medical geneticist. There's not many of us out there, so we're <laughs> rare physicians, so I'm glad to be at a rare tumor um, <laughs> talk. So, but I'd like to talk actually what is medical genetics, because a lot of people do not know what this, this is. People know who an endocrinologist is, people know who a medical oncologist is, people know who a cardiologist is and a nephrologist are. But they don't know who medical geneticists are. So we are physicians, and we see, f we see patients, and we do genetic testing on patients that make a difference in their medical management. And there's a lot of genetic variety within the human genome. And I'd like to use this slide to describe some of them and where uh, genetic testing with respect to patients affected with uh, neuroendocrine disorders uh, fit in. So this is a graph I, I, I show to most of my colleagues. And depending on the environment and the genetics, you are going to be afflicted with a disease. So it's an interplay between your genetics and what you're exposed to. So over here, the environmental effects takes a predominant role. So if you're exposed to a virus, despite your genetic makeup, you're going to get sick. You're either going to get the flu or, or you're going to uh, get a cold. But we do have some families who seem to not get colds too frequently, and even if they don't get vaccinated for the flu, they seem to be, avoid the flu. So there's some genetic predisposition to them, but they don't see a genetics physician. That genetic variability is not very strong, and we haven't localized it to a specific point in the human genome. Then we move up the ladder. So we move up the, up the curve in that the genetic contribution plays a little bit of a stronger role. And these are disorders like high blood pressure, uh, stroke, um, coronary artery disease, where you see these in families. But again, we haven't found the genetic locus for that. We haven't found the specific gene for stroke or coronary disease or high blood pressure. But it runs in families, but we don't, they don't see a genetics physician. Then we keep going even higher. So there are disorders like inflammatory bowel disease, autoimmune disease, where we know the immune system in the body plays a significant role in that um, pathogenesis. Uh, 
But again, we don't know the exact gene. So where, if of all, the, all of this genetic variation, what kind of patients do we see then? Um, what we do see are patients where we know that there's one gene causing the disorder, and irrespective of the environmental effect, even if you, you know, um, don't smoke, exercise properly, you still end up getting the cancer. It's because the gene is so strong, and that's, for instance, BRCA, which is the breast cancer gene, and the ovarian cancer gene, or Lynch syndrome, which is the hereditary colorectal cancer. So this is where hereditary cancer fits in, and this is where medical geneticists see patients, where there's one gene where we can attribute most of the disease uh, phenotype. You're gonna see a lot of papers down here and you're gonna see a lot of genetic testing that are offered to a lot of people, direct to consumer, send your buckle swab to ancestry.com, 23andMe, et cetera. So they are, that's recreational genetics. They do look at, they do look at, they do look at specific areas of the genome that in the end, there are some medically actionable ones, such as some founder mutations in some sort of rare diseases. But they, they generally will tell you at the end, eat right, you know, uh, exercise, don't smoke, et cetera, to decrease your risk of developing cancer. And that cancer is non-hereditary cancer, and that genetic variation is very small. So breast cancer, you can consider, is a very, you know, very common cancer, but there are hereditary forms which are up at this side of the curve, and then there's non-hereditary forms. So the non-hereditary forms, generally the terminology we use is single nucleotide polymorphism. It's not a very strong genetic change. The terms we use up here is mutation, uh, a pathogenic variant. So those are very different types of terminology that we're referring to when looking at the three billion different uh, letters in the uh, human genome. So that's to give you a sense on what genetics is and where medical genetics fits in. And hopefully we can discuss very quickly now what, uh, how it applies to uh, neuroendocrine tumors. So hereditary cancer, like Shireen had said, is that uh, uh, it differ, differs from sporadic cancer. So in sporadic cancer, you're actually born with a normal set of genes, right? And then something happens through life, and then somewhere in your body, you develop one mutation, whether it be age, smoking, radiation, unknown factors of virus, what have you. But that mutation only happens somewhere in your body. And then later on in life, you develop another hit, and then that develops into a cancer, right? So that's what sporadic or non-hereditary or the run-of-the-mill cancers, and these generally occur in most cancer patients, 90%, and you don't see a family pattern. You see random cancers in a family. You typically have to be elderly to acquire these two hits because you were born with a normal set of genes. It takes you X number of years to develop the first hit and then it takes you a next number of years to develop the second hit. So that's why it's usually, you're usually a, a little bit elderly. And it's common cancers like prostate cancer, breast cancer, colorectal cancer, right? So in hereditary cancer, it's, it's, it's very different. So that occurs in the minority of cancer patients, about 10% of them. And you are actually born with a genetic alteration right at birth. Either your dad gave it to you or your mom gave it to you. And the first cell that made you has that genetic alteration. And your genetic material is identical to that first cell that makes you. And then that first cell splits and splits and splits and splits and becomes your whole body. So your whole body has this genetic alteration, including your blood, your adrenal gland, your GI system, your brain, etc. So that places your body at exquisitely high risk because all of them are at a head start because they all have the first mutation. And then very quickly in life, you develop the second mutation. So these patients, you usually see a family pattern of similar types of cancer. And then you also, these patients develop unusual tumors. They develop bilateral tumors. They develop tumors very early in life. And they develop, but usually, you know, about 10 years earlier is what we generally say. And then when you do a blood test, because your blood cells arose from that one single cell that you were born from, also has a mutation. When you compare that to the non-hereditary cancer patients, when you test their blood, you won't see a mutation. You only see the mutation in the actual tumor because that's where it was localized to. So putting that into context, the question everybody will ask is, could my neuroendocrine tumor be hereditary? Neuroendocrine tumors collectively are rare, and 
therefore, rare tumors are usually should be uh, a red flag that it's uh, potentially hereditary. So I see a lot of neuroendocrine tumors because they are just rare tumors in general versus those women who have breast cancer or, or, uh, or other people who have colorectal cancers. Depends on the subtype, family history, age. So if you're younger, right, if you have bilateral disease, and if you have a certain type of uh, histology seen by either, you know, Sylvia or Osgur, then that will prompt a referral for a genetics assessment. Or if you have multiple cancers, you have a, a medullary thyroid cancer and a pheochromocytoma, right? Or if you have a, a constellation or of different types of cancers, such as a pheochromocytoma and a, and a kidney cancer, that would be a, an indication. And, and neuroendocrine tumors, by and large, a lot of them are hereditary. So if you compare all breast cancers, only 10% are usually hereditary. If you look at pheochromocytoma or paraganglioma, almost 30 to 40% of them as a group are hereditary. And medullary thyroid cancer, as mentioned, it's almost a quarter are familial. Also, adrenocortical carcinoma, if it was happened at a young age, almost 30 to 40% of those are hereditary. So and the question is, is why should you do the genetic testing? Not only does it make a difference on you, because we have to start looking at the other organs in your body, but it also makes a difference for your family. All right, so we'll go over f some examples. So I found this nice website, not because I was coming to this, but I was looking for a resource for you, and it was actually in this website, is that it actually very, very nicely highlights with an asterisk if, if this should be if potentially, of all the neuroendocrine tumors, is yours potentially hereditary, and should you see a genetic, genetic, medical geneticist or genetic counselor? And they are written with the asterisk, and these, those are the ones that uh, um, you know, I'm going to go over. So whoever made this, it's, they're, they're pretty smart. So, <laughs> So th the first one is uh, multiple ne endocrine neoplasia, which, which we alluded to, is that the, the sine qua non or the, the, the big, the big uh, tumor is usually the medullary thyroid cancer, and it is caused by a mutation in a gene known as RET. But they also are at risk of developing parathyroid hyperplasia and also pheochromocytoma. So that's why we should do the genetic testing, because if you have a RET mutation, we have to start looking at your pheochromocytoma. We have to look at your adrenal glands. We have to start looking at your parathyroid glands very, very regularly. So a lot of disorders have been associated with pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma. And this is just a graph on the, the pace at which the genetics of neuroendocrine tumors has really, really gone up in that back in 1990, there was only maybe one or two genes associated with neuroendocrine tumors, at least the pheochromocytomas. And now it's almost up to 12, 13, and it's happening faster and faster and faster because genetic testing is becoming cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. So I'm going to go over a few of these right now. The first is neurofibromatosis type 1. This is a very severe disorder that uh, affects the whole body, but patients are at risk of developing a pheochromocytoma. And these patients are also at risk of developing a lot of cutaneous lesions. These are, these are little bumps on the body known as um, neurofibromas, cafeolet macules. They get skeletal problems. So if you have any of these manifestations and a pheochromocytoma, you need to see a geneticist because we have to make sure you're not at risk of any other tumors. These patients are also at risk of breast cancer, gastrointestinal stromal tumors, brain cancer, and other types of cancer. So this is one gene and one of the first genes associated with a pheochromocytoma. Another disorder that is a multi-system disorder is known as von Hippel-Lindau, and this is what I was talking about, is if you have a pheochromocytoma or paraganglioma and you have another tumor somewhere in your body or you have a family history of another tumor, then you need to think about this disorder. So what are other tumors associated with von Hippel-Lindau? They are associated with CNS tumors or brain vessel growths known as hemangioblastomas. They can occur in the brain, spine, or eye. They are also um, associated with kidney cancer, pancreatic cysts, and a host of other problems throughout the body, including uh, the testes and the ovaries and the ears. And these require multidisciplinary care. So again, if you have a pheochromocytoma and you're found to have a VHL mutation, we need to look at your whole body. So these patients undergo intensive surveillance with an annual brain MRI, spine MRI, abdominal imaging, urine catecholamines, um, et cetera, et cetera. 
So succinate dehydrogenase is another gene associated particularly with paragangliomas and pheochromocytomas, and they, again, are at risk of developing this renal carcinoma and the gastrointestinal stromal tumor. And the reason that they are at risk of having these tumors is that the pathway that these genes are involved in cause problems in these organs also. And this is a very, very new gene. There's a bunch of different subunits associated with this gene, and this is where the pathologist comes in and looks under the microscope to see if there's expression of this gene properly to prompt a referral for a genetics assessment. So here, if you're diagnosed with this mutation, we have to start looking at your neck and your chest and your abdomen to see if you have a paraganglioma sitting somewhere else in the body. Another uh, disorder is multiple endocrine neoplasia type 1. It's totally different than multiple endocrine neoplasia type 2. They're different genes and different disorders. So these, gene, these patients have primarily a, a uh, parathyroid hyperplasia where they have problems with their calcium. They also can get carcinoids of the bronchus or in the lungs and in the thymus. And they also get another neuroendocrine tumor known as an adrenocortical carcinoma. So adrenal cortical carcinoma is, an, is a neuroendocrine tumor that's especially unique in that it has three different disorders associated with it. One is the one that I mentioned, multiple endocrine neoplasia. So if you take all ACC or adrenal cortical carcinomas in adults, about 1 or 2% of them will be due to multiple endocrine neoplasia. Another very severe genetic disorder known as lee fraumeni syndrome, these patients are at increased risk of developing brain, breast, and sarcoma. Um, if particularly you had a, a, a pheochromocytoma or a, a adrenal cortical carcinoma diagnosed when you were a child, almost 50 to 80 percent of them have a germline mutation in p53. And finally, a colorectal cancer gene, even though it's very prevalent, it's actually associated with some rare people who have colorectal cancer and adrenal cortical carcinoma can have a germline mutation in this disorder. So I only have two minutes, but I wanted to go over a scenario, and I'll go over it very quickly to give you an idea of the power of genetic testing. So this is a patient seen, his name is Robert, and he was uh, seen for medullary thyroid cancer, and he was diagnosed five years ago. He believes his mother also had some sort of thyroid cancer, but doesn't keep in touch with her. Uh, so we conducted genetic testing on him, and he has a RET mutation, which is multiple endocrine neoplasia type 2. And then he's found to have a pheochromocytoma because we have to start looking in his body for a pheochromocytoma, right? So he has surgery to move the right adrenal gland, and he's doing well. So what about Robert's family? So this is what's called autosomal dominant inheritance. So anything we find in Robert, his first-degree relatives are 50% related to him, so they can harbor that same genetic mutation also. His kids, his siblings, and his parents can also have this genetic mutation. Probably his mother has it. So what do we do? We get a, an urgent call. To, the genetic counselor gets an urgent call in that his daughter is now pregnant. So what do we do with his daughter? His daughter is at 50% risk of harboring this genetic mutation, but now we have the precise mutation that we found in her dad, so it doesn't take us long to do the genetic testing. Usually genetic testing takes about you know, one month to two months, but if you have the precise genetic change in the family, it will, it can be detected quite quickly in uh, the daughter. So we test the daughter and we find out she's a carrier. We do biochemical screening and she's pregnant. She doesn't have a pheochromocytoma, so she can continue on with her pregnancy. But she's 18 years old, and what about the baby? The baby is also now at 50% risk. So what can we do about the baby? So what we can do at the baby very early, at about 10 weeks of age, uh, gestation, we can take a sample from the placenta to see if it has a genetic alteration that Robert has, that Mary has. And depending on that, every woman is entitled to continue the pregnancy or stop the pregnancy. So given that the baby has this genetic alteration, we find the baby has a genetic alteration. It's a 50% 50, 50 risk, right? It's a flip of the coin. Baby has a genetic alteration. Mary decides to stop the pregnancy. This is an unexpected pregnancy. The baby has a RET mutation. She's seen what her father has gone through, is well-educated and counsels, and decides to stop the pregnancy because the baby is uh, affected with uh, multiple endocrine neoplasia type 2. And now she's ready five years later with another partner and wants to have a baby that does not have multiple endocrine neoplasia type 2. What are her options? So we can take her sperm, partner sperm. We can take her eggs. We can look for that precise genetic change that was seen in her family and give back the eggs that, and embryos that do not have this genetic change back into her. 
Therefore, her, her baby will not have multiple endocrine neoplasia type 2, stopping this genetic disorder and stopping the cancers in the family. So that was my case. I'm sorry I ran out of time. Thank you, Raymond. That was a wonderful place for us to end the formal presentations of this part of the session because that's really the future, right? Prevention. Thank you. Great stop.